The Rebel Capitalist Show. M2 is up. It's there in partly because incomes are up. And that's on a, a baseline, or what's the right word? Even going back to 2019, uh, incomes are up higher than they yes. were in 2019. It's not like we're coming from a low base. Yes. And that's with extremely high uh, unemployment. So we're talking about the goods being manufactured in the United States. So all of those companies and entrepreneurs have to set up shop here to create those goods domestically. At the same time, you have incomes up, let's say, 20 or 30 percent since where uh, compared to where they were in 2019. So you have those entrepreneurs competing against the government for those workers to create the goods that we need to produce domestically. So what does that do to wages? Because the, the entrepreneur is going to have to increasing put out more and more and more as far as payroll in order to attract those individuals away from uh, the government. Uh, there's that competition there. So how does that affect consumer prices? Yeah, and it's partially going to depend on what those corporations feel that they can pass through to their customers. Uh, and so as they increase wages, uh, then they have the option of either uh, reducing their, their own profit margins because say they feel that you know demand's going to be kind of weak and they can't pass on the prices to consumers uh, and they don't really have a choice to pay higher wages, so they have to pay those to, to attract the right employees. Uh, but then they, if they have trouble passing those, those costs on to consumers, then their margins get squeezed. Uh, on the other hand, if they are able to pass through those, those cost increases to consumers, uh, then that's where you get a, a broad rise in prices. And as an, you know, as a, an anecdotal example, uh, you know, we replaced our mattress. Uh, it, it basically had like an issue with it. Uh, and we we had like a kind of a warranty thing. We get the you can get the same mattress, uh, mm. and you just you just pay the difference uh, of cost of, of how how the price changed. And it was up twenty percent uh, in in like a thirteen month period. It was like a, a little over a year is up twenty percent for the same mattress. Uh, and and that's not you don't see that kind of thing in, in CPI. And another way to look at CPI is that you know a big chunk of the CPI is uh, you know basically the way that they calculate. Um, uh, you know your 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 rent or your your equivalent uh, owner's equivalent rent. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so because you're in major cities, like you mentioned, you know cities boarded up and things like that. We've had a decline in in rents at, and, and prices in some of those cities. Uh, another, you know, and we've also had all sorts of moratoriums on 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 removing people from from uh, you know uh, properties for not paying rent and things like that. And so that's kind of weighed down uh, some of the the broad indices while other things have gone up. And so you've had that kind of balancing act. So if you if you were to get a uh, those those declines were to stop happening at the same time as those individual consumer prices are still going up, that's when you can start to get an uptick in even some of those official CPI measures. Let alone you know the fact that you know people can calculate their own basket of inflation because not you know you, you don't purchase the same things I purchase. We especially you know if you look at say someone with a family they have three kids they're going to be purchasing very different things than someone who has no kids or so you know, basically what you know. What sort of lifestyle you live really affects kind of what what uh, you know your your inflation basket looks like, and people can calculate their own inflation basket and start to see that you know likely they're going to begin going up if they haven't already, uh, you know throughout kind of as we get later into 2021. Yeah, we talk about incomes going up all the time, the us macro geeks, but oftentimes we forget that expenses uh, or expenses have been maybe cut in half because most people don't have to pay rent. Uh, they haven't been paying their mortgage, and that's the the biggest chunk of most people's uh, uh, profit and loss, let's say, or their or their expenses. Um, and so you increase incomes, you decrease expenses. You've got a lot more purchasing power. And I think a lot of people would say, "All right, well, the United States has done better because they have done stimulus." And I I think in the short term that that's that that's true. Absolutely. But I always think, what does this do to the economy in the long term? And what type of distortions are we creating right now that are going to potentially affect the economy in the future? And we talked about Uber. We talked about all of the, the your mattress is going up by 20 percent. You can't get a reservation at a restaurant. Uh, the government is paying people to stay on. Entrepreneurs are now having to compete with the government. Uh, I mean, what, what does that do 
uh, longer term, I mean, I'm thinking five years, 10 years down the road, or is that an economic question that really should be a political question? Uh, so, it's, you know, that's one of those things where economics and politics start to blend and, and, yeah. and people kind of mix their own ideologies into it. And it gets really complex to kind of sort out what is true and what is not. The way I put it is it really kind of depends on the, the effectiveness of that spending. Uh, and so if that money goes towards infrastructure projects, if that money goes, you know, high quality, like needed infrastructure projects, not not kind of the bridges to nowhere uh, thing. But, you know, for example, one of the one of the most economically powerful things in the United States history was the interstate highway system. Uh, which was put in place, you know, under the Eisenhower administration. Uh, and so that was one of the largest public works projects in history. Uh, but that was extremely accretive uh, to, to value because, it, you know, it boosted the pr productivity of the country so much. So that was an example of a high quality infrastructure project. Whereas if you were just kind of building, the, if you're kind of do, doing the, the, you know, the common saying of you're digging holes and filling them back up, uh, that's not, that's not, you know, producing long term productivity. And so if money goes into, you know, better Internet speeds, better, uh, you know, cr fixing crumbling in infrastructure, things like that, uh, that could be accretive to, to longer term GDP. Uh, on the other hand, if it, if it, you know, gets wasted, if it gets kind of uh, squirreled away to things that are not very effective, uh, that's when you start to get, you know, potentially inflation because you, you've increased the broad money supply a lot, but you have not increased the, the availability of products and services. You have not increased productivity by a corresponding amount. Uh, and so it really kind of depends on, on how that gets spent over time. Now, the, the, the spikes we've seen from uh, broad money supply due to stimulus checks, they mostly offset that big deflationary shock. And so if you looked at, uh, you know, say, incomes, for example, you saw, you know, you have a trend line. And so most recessions, you go below trend, then eventually you come back up to roughly where the trend was. Now, this recession was different because of the large fiscal response. And so we saw periods where income spiked above trend. Uh, then av as there's like periods of no, no stimulus, like say between March of 2020 and then kind of that the autumn period where they, you know, did another round. Uh, so from there you had kind of a, you went back to trend uh, and you kind of were, were roughly back at trend again because you had that offset where the stimulus was wearing off, uh, but also people lost their jobs. Uh, and so you had that kind of, you're, you're back at trend, but then they did more rounds of stimulus. And so it's really kind of about keeping it above trend is what they're doing rather than just kind of keeping it at trend. And so we'll see how this plays out. You know, the, the challenging thing from a, a political perspective is that back in 2008, uh, you know, the banks got bailed out, uh, but the, the broad public didn't get bailed out. And so, the, you know, they're not going to accept the idea that, that they're not going to get bailed out this time. And so that's where you have that dynamic where they, they, they set up one incentive. And so they have to kind of do the corresponding, the opposite now. Uh, and so, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, but over time, that is that is one of the risks to be aware of, that as you increase the broad money supply this much, uh, you do get inflation most likely. Uh, so basically, you, you better make sure that those funds are spent uh, in, in a productive way that actually increases products and services. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there's going to be a lot of political pressure to continue the stimulus, uh, just sending people checks, UBI, whatever you want to call it, um, whether that's a bailout or I, I think they've already been bailed out <laughs> because they're, because they're they're making a ton more money now than they used to on aggregate total. I know there, there's pockets of people who are 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 really hurting, but um, so if if you have the government in the the mix there and they continue to send out checks, aren't we at risk of building an economy around stimulus? And therefore, we have to have it. I, I, to me, it seems like QE. Remember, you know, when Ben Bernanke did QE, it wasn't QE one; it was just QE, because they said that we wouldn't need two, three, four, and now infinity. And I mean, if we get the same thing with stimulus, I mean, can we ever pull that back, or do we just continue to have to add more and more and more stimulus? Yeah, that could be very hard to pull back. I think the limiter there is if you were to get, uh, you know, kind of unavoidable inflation. Uh, and so now we're kind of in the period where we're all debating about what, uh, it, how high inflation is. Uh, so some of us are pointing out to our 20% our mattress year over year increases. Other people are saying, no, CPI is still below two. And, you know, we're kind of, everyone's kind of debating, you know, how much CPI there, there is, how much inflation there is. Now, if you were to get a, a period where you have unmistakable inflation, uh, that's the thing that kind of puts the brake on fiscal policymakers' ability to keep doing that. And so that's when you get those really hard choices where they, they, they're kind of forced to pull back. Uh, otherwise, they could lead to a potentially a very inflationary outcome. 
Uh, and so that's I'm a, basically that's why I'm watching these base effects so much to see, you know, we're going to get these like kind of brief inflation spikes uh, just because of the base effects. And then we got to see how persistent that is. And so if, say, the deflation is correct and like, the you know, the debt, the technology, uh, all these other things kind of overwhelm the inflationary response, uh, well, that gives policymakers more incentive to do it again because they basically were able to, you know, send everyone checks and not really get the bill for it in, in a matter of speaking. On the other hand, if you, if the inflationists end up being correct and, and think that, okay, this is probably enough to kind of trigger a, a more structural change in inflation, uh, well, that kind of starts uh, putting brakes on the policymakers' ability to keep doing that. And I think, you know, a, as you look at different types of, stim of stimulus or uh, aid, I think there are, you know, there are different like, ones that are more effective than others. And so one of the things I would have liked to have seen, for example, is a reduction in payroll taxes if they want to keep stimulating kind of the, the working class, uh, because that allows them to keep more of the paycheck they otherwise would have gotten. It also, if you if you do that for the employer uh, employer side, then it makes it cheaper for them to hire people because they're they're paying kind of a you know a smaller percentage, uh, you know, uh, from hiring people. Right. And so I think that's one where it would have been nice to see maybe some work around there, uh, because that can you know let people keep more of a check without kind of having that competing force of, you know, you're getting stimulus check, but then, you know, a private sector is offering a job. That makes it just basically more cost effective to have a job and more cost effective to hire people. And so, you know, people can debate about what, what the best levers to pull are. Uh, and those are things I'm watching as we go forward to see, you know, what my, how it would affect my inflation versus deflation outlook to see, you know, what is the magnitude of the spending and also where is it going? Who's it going to? Uh, is it increasing productivity? Things like that.